Um, so we will give a couple of minutes for people to, to arrive. And then uh, I will do a very short introduction. And then uh, you will jump into the presentation. And Andrew Leach will be the respondent uh, to, tonight, as I mentioned. And we are always doing uh, the third round of the sessions, David. So we have the, the first day, Seder Keller with their house with uh, lodges. Um, yeah. And then uh, yesterday we have Philman uh, with the, the student village uh, near Arus. And today mm -hmm. is great to have you. You are the only one not completed. So we are very excited to see the building under construction. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And we will close tomorrow with Tom and, and Six Eight. So great. interesting to see the resurgence of a student housing in the, in the debate from, from the whole generation, like a, this archaic type that is back to the discussion. Yeah, yeah. allows great. to test contemporarily. Um, so let's give one more minute and, and we will start. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third talk of the Acute House Lecture Series at the University of Sydney. Um, and we will have the pleasure to have today David Cohn from David, David Cohn Architects. Um, and first, we would like to start uh, with acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the first Australians on whose traditional lands the University of Sydney stands, the Gadigal of the Euro Nation, and pay our respect to the elders, past and present. They have a sovereignty was never ceded and treaties were never signed. And the First Nation peoples remain strong in their connection to country and culture. Um, and as I was mentioning a, a minute ago, we have the pleasure to be hosting today for the third talk. Uh, it's an hour earlier that we have been doing recently because I think David is going later to who's one of his uh, projects in Birmingham, or I don't know where you're taking the train to. Um, but it's fantastic to be able to virtually host David Cohn Architects to talk about a new quad for the new college on, in Oxford. No? Um, many of you may know David. Um, if not, David is an architect and educator based in London. David Cohn Architects works internationally on arts, education, student housing, and residential projects, specializing in interdisciplinary collaboration. Current major projects include the, the recently completed uh, two buildings for the Greenwich Peninsula that you have seen all over the media. And if not, you should check. Uh, the new campus that today he's gonna explain us for the new college in Oxford, a new architecture faculty for the University of Hassel in Belgium in collaboration with Bob and Bow, um, and the new market halls for Birmingham City and La List in collaboration with its size projects. David was previously a visited professor at q 11 in Belgium and is currently a lecturer at the Architectural Association, leading a course on the future of collaboration in architecture. Please join me in welcoming David Cohn. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you very much, Guillermo. Um, delighted to be here. It's uh, my first uh, opportunity uh, to, to be involved at the University of Sydney, so that's a, a real pleasure. Uh, I, I lived in Sydney for a year ago, a year about 30 years ago. <laughs> So um, I, I, I know the place and yeah, hopefully I, I'll, I'll return in person at some point. Um, yeah, it's a great uh, invitation to be able to talk about this project, as Guillermo said. Um, it's, it's live. Uh, it's currently on site. I was on site yesterday. Uh, I can show you some photographs from my visit yesterday. So it's all very fresh. Um, and um, I think Guillermo uh, and the course's topic it is very interesting, obviously, for us. And I'm going to try and position the project in the context of uh, the huge house uh, kind of question um, around the resurgence of the type, to what degree it has been um, around for a very long time and gone through many evolutions, and perhaps with it using our example in Oxford, uh, how are these very 
historic issues being adapted to the contemporary circumstance. Um, so I think the, the invitation was to talk for about 45 minutes. Um, I have lots of slides um, and I will, I will go at different paces. Some, some I might skip depending on how we're getting on. And then I understand at the end, we're going to have some, uh, a question or two. Um, right, so hopefully you're all seeing the slides. Uh, so this is um, an aerial render of the project, just to give you a bit of a sense of um, where we'll end up. Um, and what you're seeing is a site very near the center of Oxford. Um, there are a ring of existing buildings that you can see around three new buildings. And those are the ones that have the gray roofs and, and the, the shape. Um, in the bottom right hand corner is the new entrance, uh, which is the long thin building, uh, which is a porter's lodge. And then there's a tower uh, with an accommodation wing associated with it. Then there's a new quad building in the center, this kind of horseshoe, and that creates three quads. One to the west, which is for New College School, uh, which is the old building here, and one to the east um, by completing this L-shaped building here. The site is generally from the 19th century. Um, there were villas and gardens, and our insertion is converting it from a, a kind of domestic context into a collegiate one. But a lot of what I'm going to tell you is about the kind of genesis of the project, uh, and then finally arriving at construction. Um, and just for anyone that, that, that does know Oxford, um, the site is that the red ring on the right, most people come, come via the train station. So, uh, and the center is, is quite a kind of dense area. I don't know if you can see the cursor here, it's around here and the old college, uh, new college's campus is here. And I, I suppose new college, um, what that tells you is it's, it's very old because at, at one point in its history, it was new. I think it was uh, the, the third college dedicated uh, to Mary. And so it was its longer name is, uh, you know, the new college of St. Mary. Um, but, you know, a bit of a kind of a quad infrared uh, image of uh, Oxford reveals that a lot of the city fabric is this um, building type uh, that was invented in Oxford, uh, the quad, the quadrangle uh, in Cambridge, which has a very similar uh, urban morphology, they're called courts. Um, and uh, New College, uh, one of its claims to fame is it created the first ever purpose built and de designed in, in a single phase quad. Um, and I think colleges are interesting uh, from an urban development point of view, in that the largest college, which in Oxford is St John's. Is the college with the most quads rather than the biggest quad so it's a type that aggregates and every century or two as the college expands it builds another quad on the previous um why quads so this goes back to this question of the you know the origins of the this type and um it was very much a defensive structure so this is a postcard from 1907, but it's recording an event in 1354. And uh, you'll have all heard the term town and gown. Well, this is the people of the town uh, in battle with the students. And in 1354, if you can imagine, Oxford was a, um, a market town that suddenly found itself the centre of this new uh, trend for, for education with a lot of young men arriving um, and that caused a lot of tension and the college uh, quad as a building type was originally to create um, an introverted uh, kind of almost fortified context that would segregate town from gown and this is the first Purpose built and designed in a single phase quad by the founder William of Wickham. And 
I think, you know, it, it resonates in many ways with uh, questions around contemporary urban morphology. It's, it's a mixed use building. For the first time, uh, you see a chapel combined with student rooms, combined with a dining hall, combined with a library, and it's all built in one building. Prior to this moment, all of those um, destinations uh, would have been distributed through the town. So a student arriving in Oxford in the 12th century would be billeted in one uh, accommodation, would go across to pray in another chapel and then have his um, teaching done in another building. Here, the quad is wrapped around a shared space to make a, a, a single community that is uh, separate from uh, the town around it. And, you know, it has these extraordinary parts. This is inside the chapel. Um, this is a view from outside Great Quad. And what you're seeing here, I'm going to tell you a bit more about it in a moment, is a three-sided quad, which is the first three-sided quad in Oxford, uh, garden quad. And that shows you an example of adding one quad to another. So um, New College is interesting for having been built over the city wall. So um, here is a front quad, the one I've been telling you about, what we call Great Quad. Uh, at the same time, Cloister Quad was um, added. And that's uh, perhaps if you've seen the Harry Potter films, that's Cloister Quad. So uh, it, it's redolent with all the kind of images of uh, these type of institutions. Um, and then Garden Quad that I was telling you about was added. Now, I think what's very interesting is obviously if, if one's ex accepting that uh, a four-sided quad is about a defensive structure that creates an inside and outside, a community and a city, obviously the shift to a three-sided quad is quite radical. It's suddenly that defensiveness is lost. And um, I think this is a very deliberate move. Um, it was about 250 years between front quad and garden quad. And in that time, the relationship between town and gown had improved to the point that townsfolk, wealthy townsfolk, would be invited to take up residence within colleges for an education. And a garden quad was built for that purpose. So its openness formally um, is you know, analogous to its uh, institutional opening up. Um, and here you can see a drawing. Uh, so garden quad was three-sided quad uh, designed by Bird. Apparently, it was uh, inspired by the um, Corps d'Honneur at the entrance to Versailles. So, you know, much like today, uh, perhaps they didn't have um, journals in the same way, but there was definitely a kind of currency in um, fashionable designs. And so, Christopher Wren, uh, I understood, had been to Versailles and told. Uh, other British architects about it, which led to this three-sided court. Um, and so beyond um, the 17th century when that was built, um, you see here uh, Hollywell Quad. This was the last major development by New College. It was in the 19th century prior to our uh, project. Um, and this is Gilbert Scott. Um, and then finally a library built uh, after the war, First World War. Um, so all of those things are in the little blue bubble. So um, I guess from this perspective, again, you can see this sense of um, a college aggregating, uh, growing by adding new uh, quads. And our site, uh, which is called the Savile Road site, is the red dotted um, pocket of land. Uh, which is to the north. Um, and so this is now correctly oriented, uh, the old college campus and a short walk away to the north, um, the new site. So it was an international design competition in 2015. Um, and uh, we, uh, we won the competition, I think, on the basis of our presenting our research about the history of the quad type and then making a case for what would be a contemporary version that was both in keeping with the tradition, but in other, in other ways uh, innovating within it. And we did a lot of research to understand how the quad as a type has evolved, how it works. Um, 
One's very conscious in New College and in other colleges that has a very distinctive experience that you go through the wall of one uh, quad into another and you, you literally, you know, there's 250 years of architectural history through a very uh, thin uh, membrane um, and that the journey through a college is very much of this sequence of large interior rooms, um, which, you know, becomes the, the space of the community. Um, and uh, we started to document all of those moments um, and then to compare what we understood of uh, New College to other colleges in, in Oxford. So, of course, uh, I think there's 30 something colleges, so lots of uh, variety. Um, these are examples of other uh, colleges that are, you know, exquisite plan forms. Um, and you can see degrees of open and closed, different scales, um, figures in which chapels project into larger uh, quads to make two. Um, you know, so there was a, there's this kind of wide variety out of which, you know, we were interested to evolve the, the most appropriate um, version of the type for our site. Um, and this is, I suppose, a kind of slightly Idris Khan inspired palimpsest of all of the um, quads in Oxford to give you a sense of the kind of variety of scale. Um, another um, very interesting inspiration that we came across doing our research was this book. Um, so Nicholas Pevsner uh, is probably um, Britain's historically most celebrated architectural historian. Um, he wrote a lot about the idea of the picturesque in the 1930s and 40s. This book here um, was only published uh, at the beginning of uh, this century. And that was because a lot of the uh, material for this book was lost or uh, you know, undiscovered in, in, in Pevsner's archive. And um, the book brings together a lot of uh, material <clears throat> that he was working on um, around taking ideas about planning picturesque landscapes and applying them to planning towns. So uh, the, the tradition of the English uh, landscape garden from the Romantic period was that you would create almost a kind of augmented naturalness um, by the picturesque distribu distribution of parts within the field of vision so that you could almost kind of curate a version of nature. And wonderfully, he illustrated this theory by documenting a walk around New College. So, um, and the book has several walks. Um, so here you can see one to 12, uh, and then he commissioned a photographer to, to document the, these particular views. And his, his argument, and you could see this as in contrast to say, um, Beaux-Arts, the, you know, the French um, school of urban planning, where you know, it's very axial symmetries, hierarchies. Pevsner was saying, you know, this is, this is an alternative, which is within a historic context, context you place things in a picturesque way in order to augment the existing view and that he believes that Oxford has evolved um, through these kind of decisions making. So a much more informal, much more experience led um, evolution. Uh, again, if you compare it to say uh, Beaux-Arts planning. And here I'm gonna just trot through this walk. And I think, you know, the photographs are intended to highlight, you know, the street made around the church with the bay window projecting close to it. And here you see um, the bay. And then as you get to the end, there's a corner with um, you know, the placement of the building, its detail. Um, and this on the right is the wall of uh, New College. So the sense of the delight maybe of a completely different type of uh, street scene. Um, then, you know, Hawks Moors, uh, All Souls just pops up between the trees. Um, there's the library uh, in the background there. And this sense of the delight of walking through Oxford and these things appearing is almost cinematic fashion. And that this would be a way of designing 
new student accommodation. Um, and it's, it's a theory that is really appropriate to inserting new buildings within dense historic contexts. And Persner was in fact very, very pro-modernism. So I think this is also a theory about trying to perhaps make conservative audiences accept new things. Um, the, the, the kind of uh, bridges over the streets, you know, and this journey just keeps going. And then finally, you arrive at the Bridge of Size, uh, part of Hartford College, and then the, cent the central set piece um, of, of the main university buildings. So now I'm looking at a plan of our site again. So you can see at the bottom, uh, New College campus, and you know, in a way, what I'm trying to show you is the, the kind of compounding of different circumstances, conditions, research that became the context in which to make design decisions. So this green swathe is um, the remnants of the kind of edge of the historic city. To the north of it, the university expanded and made lots of its teaching buildings. So they, you can see this much bigger scale of architecture. Um, compared to the much more intricate um, old collegiate world to the south. And so this green band um, was like, you know, Victorian suburbia. And this was something that um, the planning authority was very keen that it be maintained. So the site has this, um, kind, of, this kind of nexus of loss of historical conditions. And you can see it being transformed from you know, the middle of the 17th century, it still feels Fascinatingly, this um, line uh, is uh, the Civil War ramparts from Charles I defending uh, Oxford um, from the parliamentarians, and that remains in our site. So you can just see it here, site of entrenchment, um, and uh, you can see gradually, I suppose, the significant change in terms of what we see today is between um, 1900s, where it's kind of gardens, um, market gardens, uh, growing things, to these buildings being built, which are basically houses with villas, one of them is a school, and uh, to where we are today, there's kind of a ring of buildings, a few solitaires. Um, and so the blue one is, is, is listed, so protected. Uh, the red one, um, is, has been demolished. Um, and then you can see the hatched ones to the left and right are these kind of bookends. And in the middle was a, was a not very happy uh, 1950s school extension uh, that we've taken down and was you know, already, despite it being the youngest building on the site at the end of its life. Um, so you can see um, the L-shaped buildings, top left, bottom left, the listed house um, on the right, and the school building that has been taken down here. If you can see my cursor, oops. And the site was kind of slightly fraught with problems. So um, top left, I mean, I won't go through all of them, but here's a good example. Um, the school has a nursery, and the nursery was directly beneath the students' rooms. So there was a safeguarding issue about um, the children you know, having some privacy. There's also the fact that the students are there to study. This is not great. Um, and so a condition like that really drove a lot of the design. How can the site be densified to provide the student accommodation that New College wants and do things like create separation between the school and uh, the college? So this is how we went about it. So the existing condition, which is these houses with gardens, and it's quite a kind of hodgepodge. Um, and the idea to insert a building where you know, the arm would on the, on the west would separate school from college. The arm on the right would create an entrance courtyard and then we would replace the buildings in the corner to create more student accommodation. And that we would um, densify the southern um, uh, greenery and we would uh, densify the buildings to the north. And this was the final uh, step, I think, in bringing all of that research about type, about um, the history of uh, 
a progression from closed to open, uh, which you can see at, travels at a glacial speed. It's like 250 years of to, to move from separate from uh, the city to open to the city to what we proposed was that um, at the competition in 2015, the building and the landscape would have an equivalence whereby uh, that, that there would be the, the greatest openness between the two. And I suppose metaphorically, this was um, about promoting new colleges and ongoing uh, evolving institution that seeks yet greater transparency and openness uh, to um, the town, to landscape, uh, to um, new students. And you could begin to see uh, from the, these questions around maintaining views into the site. Uh, I think the fact of south facing courts um, was, was very significant and also the form um, will the kind of shape of the building, I think, will be picked out very much by the, the sun traveling um, around the south and illuminating the, the kind of scallops um, in, in quite a dynamic way. But the, I think probably for anyone that's seen this project, one's immediate thought will be that's perhaps quite a willful design. It has as a piece of architecture, it suggests quite a high degree of autonomy. It's different to its neighbors, neighbors. But I think I'm hoping that what will gradually become clear is quite how much what appears to be um, something about itself is driven almost exclusively by things around it. So um, the reason for the three sided uh, was about this openness, but also um, it's quite a small quad. Remember the, the, the drawing with all of them on top, it's, it's almost at the smallest end. So we wanted to make it have a sense of interior. So that shape means that um, it's a kind of compensation for not being a larger quad, but also that the inner um, orientation is about seeing past the listed house. So you're not looking at the back of uh, the building, which has its primary facade here. You can see how to the east and west, um, the building is very much about creating urban spaces. Um, and there's also things like that, you know, the, the city wants colleges to become less closed and promote views. So we achieved the longest view from, so if you remember the public, you walk past the gate into the site and you see as far into New College as possible. Um, there was a need to separate the new building from heritage. And, um, and I think going back to the analysis of journeys through these types of environments, um, a real focus on how do we maximize the walk that one might enjoy around the building through gardens and how could one create different types of garden. Um, in section, the building was you know, heavily um, kind of contained by um, the surroundings and not building higher than the uh, listed house. Um, and I think, I mean, this is looking at um, Sterling, uh, Sterling's uh, Flory building uh, at the top of the page, which is, I mean, the work of Sterling, if you know, you know our practice work, very interested in. Um, and I think this is perhaps quite a radical uh, reinvention of, of the quad. Um, and then the Baker building um, in Boston, um, which has this kind of fantastic uh, sinuous um, arrangement of student rooms. So that these were two more contemporary precedents that were um, informing our thinking. Um, I think I said something about the plan form the roof form equally um, is very fluid. And that was about uh, being contextual in as much as the architecture on the rest of the site is, I mean, it's from different periods. So it's like uh, neo-Gothic uh, on the left, arts and crafts in the center, 
and a kind of hybrid on the right. And um, these architectural styles are, one of their attributes is that the roofs are very important to the elevations. So they have large eaves, gables. Um, and so uh, we wanted to both work within that context, but also um, you know, create, a, create an architecture that would feel um, contemporary. And I mean, I think what's very interesting is that, I mean, I think quite a few people said, well, it reminds me of Gaudi. And uh, the work of Gaudi was not too distant in time from the neo-Gothic and arts and crafts building, but of course, for many people remains provocatively contemporary. Um, so this was our analysis of um, almost like the heartbeats of the different architectures, you know, what kind of rhythm they have. And um, you can see somehow the, the disappointment of uh, 1960s architecture in flatlining. Um, and uh, so this led to this um, new rhythm uh, to, to our building. And as the building evolved formally, um, the, these um, attitudes began to affect all of the different parts of the site. And then there was an evolution, I think, which is the, the, the drawing top right is showing that this um, general form for the plan and section then was evolved at different levels of detail to do with bay windows, uh, entrance sequences, and then the gardens um, flowing through it, achieving a gradation from more social to uh, more lawn, so something uh, Arcadian. Um, and so here was the, the, the final arrangement. And, you know, thinking about, there is a kind of utopian dimension to these um, organizations in that they, they're seeking to provide everything that a community would need in a single site. And I think Oxford and Cambridge colleges are different to a lot of universities in that rather than um, inviting students to live with people um, doing the same subject, you would often have very few people within each college doing a single subject. So all of your um, colleagues are studying something else. So there's also something, a kind of microcosm of a whole university with every subject represented. You might only have, you know, um, two architecture students, even though the year group is 40, um, because the rest are distributed for the different colleges. And so there's this sense of also the teaching and um, the curriculum being, um, you know, represented in each college. Um, and so here you can see uh, a study of how the roof forms all um, allied uh, and then how this is looking at. So the student rooms uh, wrap the views um, uh, with central corridors, so it's double loaded. And then you can see that the school has uh, occupies one wing. Um, the form of the building to the north is very much dictated by offset distances from buildings in the neighboring college. But again, I think probably a lot of the work for us was to try and make these constraints feel like an autonomous architecture so that um, one both feels that it's working with its context and has an identity and a character of its own. Um, and it, it, this is a section through the upper story on the left of uh, Sterling's uh, Flory building. And so there's also an, an interest in taking the best of uh, contemporary precedents. And you can see on the right, there are these duplex units at the top of um, the, uh, the quad in Oxford. From a material point of view, um, the site's very varied. And we we chose materials that were distinct from all of those. So um, there was a lot of local stone, um, which is no longer quarried. So we found a stone from Lincolnshire, Ancaster, uh, so fairly local. And the facade is load bearing stonework. So 
the wall supports itself. It's not open jointed. So that's unusual nowadays. Um, I think most stone clad buildings have open joints with thin stone. So this is part of um, the ambition for the building to be able to stand for um, centuries rather than decades. Um, and, but it does have a concrete frame, which I'll come on to in a bit. And then in, all, in this transformation from a, a series of gardens into a collegiate site, the inclusion of a tower was important um, for the college uh, to signify you know, on the horizon and to passers by uh, this new identity. And here you can see on the right, um, New College Bell Tower, which is in the main site, and um, the tower uh, that we've created, um, which actually, it both provides um, vertical access into adjacent student accommodation on the lower floors. Then on each floor, there's a tower for the Institute of Charity and Philanthropy. Um, and uh, obviously building a tower in Oxford, is uh, challenging because it's a world heritage site um, with a lot of development control. And so um, there was this, uh, and also there's a, there's a rule in Oxford called the Carfax rule, which is you cannot build above Carfax, which is the tower on the left, which is 23 meters. Now, obviously there are um, towers uh, which St. Mary's Church on the right, is uh, considerably taller, but this rule is to try and prevent um, the skyline being uh, lost. Uh, so, but every every tower that comes negotiates with the city authorities around its relative height to, to the Carfax Tower. Um, um, and uh, as we go further, I'll show you more of the kind of construction details. But the this these are these load bearing stone facades. They have this rather eccentric diamond pattern. Um, and that was derived from the structural engineer, Price and Myers, pointing out that a lot of historical curved, it's the first curved stone quad in Oxford. And a lot of, a lot of precedents for curved stone buildings are lighthouses, where they would tend to have tessellated stones that would interlock, obviously for uh, weathering reasons. Um, and that, developed into an interest in interlocking um, stone to create these curved surfaces. But also it has a slight kind of op art uh, dimension to it, which is the, if you add these diagonal lines to the curved surfaces, it, it almost makes the curves look yet more um, dynamic. Um, and the hope is that as the light falls through the day on these um, curved edges that are um, you know, facing south, you, you, if you're sitting in your room, you might actually be able to see the movement of the sun because of this very acute angle to south. Um, so I think here you can see then the final scheme. Um, and if you remember that first image, so you arrive at the Porter's Lodge, you get the longest view all the way through. Halfway along is this entrance, which is to the um, shared and mo most public amenities. So you come into a lobby, down a stair, into a triple height gallery space, underground, and I'll show you later, there's a, an auditorium there. But um, for students, you might go to your room through this passage. You know, there's a moment like this, which will, I hope will be extraordinary, where it's a very dense closed space, and then suddenly you look through a window and there's this triple height uh, gallery um, and you know this interest in creating as many different connections through the site as possible so you can go on a walk um, and that would be part of um, one's learning experience you know that I mean these you know, those institutions are incredibly fortunate and I think the students that get the opportunity to study there you know very spoiled <laughs> by and large um, so this is that longest view. Um, so at the back there is the west wing that has the school in it. Here's that listed house 
um, the tower, one of the existing buildings. Um, just a reminder of that. So that's looking through here with the longest view to here. Um, this is then the, the latest iteration of the main quad. Um, and you know, this sense you can see through uh, to, to the, the Civil War ramparts where Charles I defended the city, uh, which is now much more accessible in this version of, of the site. And it's become, it's a scheduled national monument. So part of the work was to make that a feature within the campus. Um, so this is looking back at the tower and you can see um, how the lower stories of the tower are to provide lift and stair access to this uh, accommodation uh, building that's replaced one of the, the houses that was on the site. And you can see the more planted uh, gardens to the south. This is looking north from that same point. So here is a view through to the Civil War ramparts. This building actually we shortened. Um, so uh, it's called Savile House. Uh, it's built in two parts at the beginning of the, of the, of the 20th century. So Savile House, Savile House extension. And one of the things that we did in order to create this East Quad was to shorten Savile House extension and provide this view through to the Civil War rampart. So that's about trying to almost maximize the um, the kind of richness of the site, uh, where the architecture is framing, guiding, providing thresholds to these moments of history. Um, and stepping back, this is the the tower, um, which I think you've seen these, and I'm conscious of time. There's this, there's this uh, underground auditorium which. I'm going to show you a bit of the entrance of in a moment. And the foyer to the auditorium is this octagonal space underground, um, which again, we're going to see a glimpse of. Um, and so this is, you know, that there's that staircase that wraps um, around uh, from where, at that point where I said there's the main entrance is the public parts, you descend into this octagon, which provides you access to all the different below ground um, rooms. So, um, and this is this gallery, this triple height gallery space, uh, different moments of its evolution. Um, the school. And I think what I'd like to get, oh yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> where we're at at the moment, is that um, we go through the final design stages. We're working with um, Sir Robert McAlpine, the contractor, uh, and there are 20 gargoyles and grotesques, which New College is famed for. They have a lot of them, and they were very keen to keep that tradition. So um, this gecko is designed to master the junction between um, to the cornices, um, and it'll look down at you uh, for, from uh, the parapet. Um, from an environmental point of view, uh, it's, I mean, it is a concrete frame building, and probably that's its, um, I think that's its downfall <laughs> environmentally, but I think it would be very difficult to build something um, like this, either out of an entirely timber uh, frame, which I think would have had issues around movement, um, or load-bearing stone, which I think probably, I don't know about Australia, but certainly in the UK, there's increasing interest in um, using local stone as a load-bearing material. And we have a load-bearing facade, but it's been held up by concrete. I think that is something if it becomes more affordable in the future, perhaps would have been relevant here. At the moment, it's still it's still expensive. Um, uh, so I think there's grout source heat pumps um, and a CHP plant. Um, and I think probably the, the biggest ambition was to build it so that it would be around for long enough that it's embodied carbon aggregated over its lifespan would be 
um, perhaps much better than the, than shorter term buildings. But that's obviously not, doesn't quite address the constructional issue around concrete. Um, what we have achieved is that the whole top floor is timber. So um, this is a grid shell um, and um, that has helped in improving the, the environmental performance of the building. So this is the, this is, so that Bloomer Lehman are a Swiss um, a timber manufacturer who are working with us. This is a, a, a similar, it's not, this isn't for our project, it's a similar uh, grid shell in, for, for a mosque in Cambridge actually. Um, and we did, through these efforts, manage to get an Institute of Civil Engineers Carbon Champion uh, acknowledgement, which I think was in recognition of the efforts that the college went to, despite um, a lot of the constraints to address carbon reduction um, over the last few years. So we picked the stone, uh, we've been making mock-ups, so I'm with the uh, college bursa there, Jez Wells and colleagues. Um, and this is a mock-up on site. So um, one's beginning to see how the diamond uh, pattern will work. And it, there's two types of stone, obviously, um, one for the parapet and um, the window frames, and the other, the main facing ash, ashlar material. Um, and the roof is made of tessellated tiles. Um, now, the colour here is a bit poppy. It's, it's actually not, it's much more even, but you get a kind of sense of the, the testing that's going on. And I, I, I really like, I really appreciate this. I mean, um, so there's 10 different shapes that um, were tessellated to minimise the junction width and um, cover the roof as smoothly as possible. Um, and so these are all computer cut. So we're on, we're on site. This was a few weeks ago. You can see the basement. So that the, the, the music hall is here and that long descent into the octagonal space is here. Um, this is the main quad. The school is here. Um, so this is the image from the poster, but the, the scaffolding came down for the structure of the tower. And next, the stone will go up in a few months. Uh, this is digging down to create that at the basement for the uh, music hall. So this is a kind of fun, this is yesterday. So here you're in the octagonal hall, you're looking back at the, the, the lift and st the stairs are here. So this is this triple height space that brings you from the entrance um, down to the common parts. Um, so here you can begin to see this octagon room, um, which gives you uh, access here to the to the, the lift and stairs to the student rooms above. Um, this was yesterday, a view inside the tower. So at some points, um, you're very much in the trees. So it's quite nice that the photograph that you know I sent Guillermo a, a few weeks ago was before the trees had um, come into leaf. And so this set, you know, sense of the changing sites. And this is the very top. So um, it's this trefoil plan. Uh, so on the right is an office um, uh, for the Institute of Charity and Philanthropy. And then you send the stair and eventually that joins the student accommodation. Uh, and then there's, there's quite a game of geometries. I mean, when we were on site yesterday, we, we, uh, I took a colleague with students from the Architectural Association and someone said, why is it, why is there a trefoil window? And I think probably in Oxford, there's a sense that probably everything is highly significant. Um, and maybe we're very aware of that. And rather than this being, you know, a symbol associated with the college, it's really that it's the building being self-similar in some ways. So the plan of the building is a trefoil. So we put a window in the tower as a kind of uh, a rhyme with the plan. And this figure reappears throughout the, um, the, the campus. So there's this uh, interest in making things have enough visual uh, uh, recognition that you, you have a sense of its autonomy and wholeness. 
I think what's extraordinary is that the view, obviously when you get to the top of the tower, uh, you see all of the uh, historic um, dreaming spires. Um, so here, this is that octagonal space is about three weeks before, again, they're building really fast, they're doing about a floor every month. Um, but here you can see the form of it that we saw the view from the inside. Uh, and then I think probably, how is it, 920, from probably at the, coming, to, coming to the end of our time, but here you can see um, the overall site, um, the, the neighboring colleges, the sense of this uh, suburban garden strip. Um, yeah, and I think that's probably the, the end of the, the presentation. So, I mean, just to kind of recap where we started, I think Guillermo's invitation was to talk about uh, student housing as having a particular history and um, you know, it, it being revisited now. Um, and I hope, I mean, I think what's been a real opportunity for us working in Oxford is that it has this very long um, history of the, and a very particular building type. So hopefully you can see how we've taken that history and layered it with all the other concerns, um, the contemporary concerns of, of, of the college and the site in order to make this new, um, this new version. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thanks very much. Thanks for the journey through both the type and, and the process. And, and now we are gonna do what we call the, the long shot. And I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Andrew Leach, a professor at the University of Sydney, who is going to uh, do this, the respondent. OK, thank you, David. Thank you. Hi, David. Uh, thank you so much for the time that you've taken to share this project with us. Really a, a provocative and um, uh, stimulating project. Um, I'm processing still a bit uh, the task that Guillermo has given me of uh, of sending just one question away, and uh, the implication is that it uh, really lands somewhere terminal, or um, I don't know, or misses completely. In which case, you're you're away scot free. Um, I haven't quite figured out what it is, but I'm going to sneak up on it, and uh, and well, we'll see. I was really drawn by the uh, the image of the photograph, uh, the, the the postcard that you shared of the uh, town versus gown uh, battle scene. Um, I've heard of it before, but I've never seen that um, that particular image, and it uh, offered a striking path to the role of the um, both um, uh, what you described in contemporary terms as the mixed use um, uh, um, accumulation of buildings and the the hard edge of the college. Uh, which clearly is um, uh, broken down both over time and through uh, the kind of gestures that you're making of the long view into um, into the into the courtyard that you um, that you have uh, designed with uh, with this new building. The the two poles that um, that I ponder a bit with uh, with all of the colleges in Oxford and Cambridge, but. Um, but it's raised again in the project that you have shared with us is um, is that between the home and the university, Domus Universitas, as um, as uh, values that always in these projects sit in tension. And thinking of, I, I think the the account that you make of the building almost as. Um, uh almost to persuade us away from the sense of its willfulness as you are uh, to borrow your own term um as something determined point by point by context historical circumstances sidelines drawing on pevsner and uh, the idea of the accumulation of the image um regulation uh and um and paths of use i find that persuasive um I find that almost entirely persuasive. And I guess here comes my question. Um, it's a long shot. I'm dra I've drawn the bow. Whether <laughs> it land, I don't know. Um, the work itself is, uh, to what extent is your thing, is your project um, a thing in itself? 
as opposed to something connected into the fabric of New College in its entirety? To what extent do you see this as something alone, uh, even as something, even as it is something determined by that with which it is surrounded? John, okay, you um, no, no, thank you for that. Um, I think that uh, when I when I go to Oxford, I think you're on mute. Am I on mute? Uh, Okay. Oh, is that me who needs the volume? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm okay with Guillermo and I are uh, trying to avoid feedback with Go for it. Okay. Please. Um when I'm in Oxford, one of the things that I'm one of the things that I'm seriously aware of is that as you go from court to court or quad, quad to quad, uh, let's not get all Cambridge on it. Um there's the architectural styles are often quite pronounced. I mean, there is a tradition of patronage in, in Oxford where, you know, you're blessed with seeing, you know, there's a wren and you go through and the, the, there's, you know, an extraordinary architect from another century um, that, is, that is totally committed to the representation of its day and that, it's the, um, there's a kind of jump cut, extreme character to that, which is, which is surprisingly contemporary in many ways. This, um, the, the type uh, creates a, a, a kind of sense of continuity in that growth is by aggregating the type. So that has some kind of um, consistency and, legibility but architecturally within that type you know oxford is you know out one door it's it's gothic out another door it's um classical you know um next one mannerist um you know and and i think that i think for me that's both a pleasure and it, the diversity of it is is really um notable and I think affecting. It makes you think you're very aware of change. You know, it, it, it is a conservative place that's, uh, it's a, you know, it's, it's a perpetual institution um, that in many ways doesn't transform itself as fast as other aspects of British society or, um, but, but it does have these, um, moments of a kind of clear interest in breaking from the past of 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 renewal and so i think it's that pleasure that probably drives an interest in um continuity of that project that you are you're extending um typologically uh, colleges but that you're taking the opportunity to um commit to a new identity um and so yes i think that you know clearly i mean it's slightly brief driven and client driven in that they chose a scheme that that was you know a, a curved quad um and it fitted their aspiration to um i think create something that felt both contextual and new um so it it doesn't feel um like we're, we're able to break very you know very far from what what the expectations are and we're just almost uh taking advantage of that um what one encounters in oxford already to do something new One shot, right? Yes. I, I don't get a follow up. It's, no, uh, no, it's, that's it. No. <laughs> uh, no, I think, yeah, I think the, both the question and the answer uh, tackle very well on that tension between in operating in Oxford and probably similar in Cambridge. Um, David, so uh, thank you very much for joining us today uh, from London. Hope you enjoyed the virtual visit to Sydney, uh, where we also have some, some of these types.
Um, and, but they are evolving differently here. And maybe that's the topic of another discussion. Um, and thanks everybody who joined us again. Um, please uh, see, uh, join us tomorrow for Tom Emerson's uh, take on Stephen Housing, which will be very different uh, to David, but also maybe the, maybe today David saw us the, the flat profile of Tom was already there in his analysis of the elevation. Uh, but I think he will also explain the constraints uh, of operating on this type uh, incredibly well, but with an incredibly diff different uh, proposal. Uh, thanks again, David, for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for, for being another night with us. See you tomorrow at 6.30. Have a good day, David. Great. Thanks, David. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot.